as you're turning this morning to Judges chapter 17. Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. As you're turning there, I'd like to uh, say my good morning to everyone. And um, also say, as Jonathan said earlier in the class, uh, Aaron, it sure is good to see you this morning. Many prayers have ascended. And we need to continue to pray that Aaron will heal without complication as he still has much um, healing to do. So we're thankful to God for that. Also, it's very good to see Gene Clark back with us also this morning. In Judges chapter 17, we're talking this month about the theme of doing what is right in your eyes. Let's read the text together. Judges 17 and verse 6 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, in the first 16 chapters of the book of Judges, what you have really is the narration of the events of the Judges themselves. But what chapter 17 through 21 do, they serve to, it's appendix kind of material, and it's telling you the why. So many of the things that we've just read about took place, the conditions that brought about so much of the deplorable, sinful activity that we read about during the time of the judges. So the fundamental and underlying cause of so much that's taking place that you know is not pleasing to God, the text says everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes. And actually that is said, or some form of it, four times in those last few chapters, 17 through 21. Doing what is right in their own eyes. And the moral chaos, the religious chaos, the the destructive behavior that that led to. It's not a new concept, nor did it end at that point in time. Perhaps you've heard the lyrics to the song, I did it my way, and now the end is near. And so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway. And much, much more than this, I did it my way. Regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. I did what I had to do and saw it through without exemption. I planned each charted course, each careful step, along the byway, and much, much more than this, I did it my way. Yes, there were times, I'm sure you knew, when I bit off more than I could chew. But through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all, and I stood tall and did it my way. I've loved, I've laughed and cried. I've had my fill, my share of losing. And now as tears subside, I find it all so amusing. To think I did all that, and may I say not in a shy way, oh no, oh no, not me, I did it my way. For what is a man, what has he got? If not himself, then he has naught. To say the things he truly feels, and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows, and did it my way. Yes, it was my way. Well, that, that song was Israel's song. That, that's the song of many today. We, we don't like for people to tell us what to do. We like to do things my way. And so in the days of the judges, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. I might mention in the passing, before looking further at the text of uh, Judges 17, that part about in those days there was no king in Israel. We understand that simply having a king would not mean that everyone does what is right, but this is stated from the vantage point of earlier passage, such as Deuteronomy chapter 17, that when you do establish a king, he has a copy of the law that he's written in his own hand. And as he judges, he reads that. He's he's governing, he's judging, he's ruling as king based on God's law. And so with that kind of king in mind. The point is that if they'd had a king that was implementing the laws of God and truly shepherding the people of God, 
then a king would have provided leadership that would not have allowed things to get in this situation. So in those days you didn't have that. There's no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Let's, let's start at the first of the chapter. The text says, there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 11 shekels of silver that were taken from you, 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and on which you put a curse, even saying into my ears, here is the silver with me, I took it. This woman was apparently quite a wealthy woman, 1100 pieces of silver. You may remember that that's what the five lords of the Philistines each promised Delilah if she would find out the secret to Samson's strength. Each one said they'd give her 1,100 pieces of silver. Another point of comparison is that when a salary is stipulated for the Levite, a, a bit further down in the chapter, Micah says to him in verse 10, Dwell with me and be a father and priest to me, and I will give you 10 shekels of silver per year. And he agreed to that. And so if 10 shekels a year would, would be sufficient income, here this mother of Micah has 1,100 pieces of, of, of silver. Apparently a wealthy person. Someone had taken it. She didn't know who, and so she put a curse on whoever did that. And Micah said, oops, that was me, and I'm giving it back. Well, the mother says, may you be blessed by the Lord my son. And when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I've wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son, and we keep reading, to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. That is the image that she's going to make, or images. And so he returned the silver to his mother. And so she says, I've wholly dedicated it. But for whatever reason, she just takes 200 pieces of it. Doesn't say what she does with the rest of it. That would leave 900. But she takes 200 in verse 4 and gave this to the silversmith. And so he makes a carved image and a molded, molded image and they were in the house of Micah. And this is just stated matter of fact that this is what's going on. It's going on in Israel. It's in the hill country of Ephraim. And the man Micah had a shrine, made an ephod and household gods, and he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. And so it's just one thing after another. You've got thievery, but the theft is returned. But then a portion of that is supposedly given to the Lord. The whole thing supposedly, but a portion of that is, is what is actually dedicated. But it's making the very thing that God forbids. The first two commandments are violated. You shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not make any, any graven images. And so we're, we're reading here and we can hardly believe in Israel this is happening. And so she does this and he gives it to Micah. But then we, get, we see it gets worse. He's got his own private shrine. Now, here again, the background is in Deuteronomy chapter 12, God had said six times. How many times does God have to say something? But he said six times in Deuteronomy chapter 12, you're not to offer sacrifice, you're not to worship in any place that you choose, but in the place that the Lord your God shall choose. And when we go to Joshua chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, it was Shiloh that the tabernacle had been erected. That's where you were to go as the central place for worship. Now, of course, you could pray at home. Of course, you could study at home. We're not, not, not talking about that. But, but to build a shrine and then to, as a place of worship, and then to install the, these idols in it. And so it's, 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 whole, it's the very thing God said not to do. And as I say repeatedly in chapter 12, the, the place for worship is the place God would cause his name to dwell which would be at Shiloh. And the tabernacle at this time was standing at Shiloh when all this is going on. And so after one thing after another, this is where the writer just has to say, okay, let me explain what was going on. Because he anticipates you should know these things are all wrong. It violates God's will. So he says, what's happening is everyone was doing what is right in his own eyes. And that right there is telling because it's not saying, well, they knew it was wrong, but they did it anyway. What the text is saying is they convinced themselves that this was okay. And they liked it. And because they liked it, they thought God liked it. People do that all the time. Here's something that I enjoy. 
here's something I like. And of course, if I like it, I'm sure God must like it. It must have His approval. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16 and verse 15? You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. And that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination unto God. Luke 16 and verse 15. I like it. Therefore, God, it's right in my eyes. Well, the, the situation develops further. There's a young man from Bethlehem. He's a Levite. And um, so he's passing from Bethlehem and Judah. And you know your geography, right? So he's, he's going up north to the hill country of Ephraim, where Micah lived. And so as he came to the mountains of Ephraim in verse 8, this is the central hill country. And he meets Micah. Micah says, tell me about yourself. Where are you from? What are you doing here? And he explained, I'm, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah. I'm on my way to find a place to sojourn. I'm, I'm looking for a place to, to live and to work, to provide an income is what that means. And so Micah says, well, that's, that's great. That's wonderful. You, you, um, th- this will be your place. You, you, you dwell with me and be a father and a priest to me, and I'll give you 10 shekels per year. So the Levite went in. Now, bear in mind, first of all, Micah has made one of his own sons, verse 5, a priest. That's holy without authority. That's the kind of thing later that Jeroboam would do, you know, when he would make priests out of all the tribes. But the other thing is, even here, this man was a Levite, but there's nothing to indicate that he was of the descent of Aaron. In other words, he's not, he's not of the priestly lineage, though he's of the Levitical tribe. And so that also is without authority from God. But he readily agrees to it. He's content to dwell with him and became like one of his sons to him. And Micah consecrated, verse 12, the Levite. And the young man became his priest and lived at his house. And so Micah says, this is great, verse 13. I know God is going to bless me now. Don't you see the irony in this? And now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as priest. So he, that tells you he knew when he appointed his son who was not Levitical, that was, without, but now I've, now I've got a Levite that's a priest, so now I know the Lord will bless me. I know I'm going to be prospering now. And this is why Hebrews chapter 3 says in verse 12, to exhort one another day by day, so long as it is called today, lest any of you be hardened, verse 13, by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is so deceitful. And here he's thinking, oh, I know God is going to bless me now. And he's doing the very kind of thing that God had said not to do. But he's convinced himself he's really going to have the blessings from God. Well, here's the thing. Chapter 17 and 18 go together. We, we, we've seen that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of bad things happening in chapter 17. When men do that which is right in their own eyes. What we see is, here's the introduction of idolatry. It's just blatant idolatry. It's the kind of thing that the prophet Jeremiah, in in Jeremiah 16 and verse 20 said, Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? And over and over the prophets talk about the folly of of carving something out of wood or making something out of stone or, or gold or silver and bowing down before that. And so doing what is right in your own eyes What did that lead to? It it led to worshiping the wrong object instead of the true and living God, worshiping gods of their own making. And so you've got idolatry, you've got got religious disorder. It's like everything God has said about the place, the the central place of worship, none of that matters. What directives he has given about who was to to serve in that dispensation as, as priest, none of that matters. And so this, this is the kind of thing that, cha- that, the kind of chaos and disorder that, that results. And we're, we're talking at that point about in one household. God's plan is just not being followed. And there's a lot of disorder, chaos, deception, and, and it's, it's sinful, and God would not be pleased with any of that. But what happens is that what was the sin of one man, Micah, is going to become in the next chapter the sin of a tribe the tribe of Dan. And so let's see what happens there. In Judges chapter 18, 
and verse 1. In those days there was no king in Israel. Now since he's just said in 17.6, every man did that which was right in his own eyes, this serves as a connection. And scholars would say that what you have here is an ellipsis. That is to say, that though it doesn't contain the rest of that part, that that would be understood, having just stated the rest of it in chapter 17, verse 6. I think that's right. In other words, why, why would you make that point again, in those days there's no king in Israel, were it not for the fact that you're saying this same point. What's happening is everyone is doing what is right in his own eyes. So, the, the tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in, for until that day their whole inheritance among the tri tribes of Israel had not yet fallen to them. And what this does, it's, it's one verse that's kind of in shorthand. In other words, it's, it, it's, it's a summary statement, and it, it's not saying that they had not been designated their allotment. It's just saying that they had not fulfill God's purpose to possess that. In the book of Joshua chapter 19, we'll turn there just for a moment, but in, in Joshua chapter 19, reference is made in verse 30 to the allotment for the tribe of Dan. And it won't be necessary to read all of this. You're, you're probably going to recognize some of the places, for example, when it mentions Zorah, in, in verse 41, that's go, and, and in verse 43, uh, um, you've got Timnah. These, these are places when you're, reading, or when you're reading in the book of Judges about Samson. You remember Timnah was where, where he got his wife from, Zorah, the valley of Zorah. Th these, these are places where the tribe of Dan was from. This is, this is the territory of Samson. But you read on a little bit further, it mentions Yarkon. That's a, that's a, uh, there's a, 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 the Yarkon River there in verse 46 mentioned. Uh, and then he says, with the region near Joppa. Now, that kind of nails it down, because Joppa is on the coast. You remember Joppa is where the harbor was that Jonah tried to run away, from, got on a ship and tried to run away from God, which of course did not work. But that's, that's on the coast, Joppa. And in Israel today, if you're at Joppa, you can see right up the coast, the sprawl of Tel Aviv. You can see all that there. So, yes, they had been allotted the land. Joshua tells us that. But, as would be the case with others, and as, as Jonathan has pointed out, the follow-through was not always there. And so, it goes on to say, in verse 47 of Joshua 19, what we'll read about in the book of Judges, chapter 18, and that is that they went beyond these, the children of Israel went up to fight against, and here it's called Leshem. It's going to be called Laish in Judges. And they took it with a sword and possessed it. They named it Dan. And so that's mentioned here, even though it's showing where their allotment was. But then it says they also went and took the territory up to the north. Now, at first glance, especially if one's not studied legislation about this in the Old Testament, you might think, well, what difference does that make? They, they were having a hard time occupying the, the place, the boundaries that God had given. So, is it a big deal if, if they acquire land somewhere else? And the answer is yes. Because God had put each tribe just where He wanted it. And, for example, in Numbers 36, which I'm not turning to, I'm just citing it. But in that chapter... Remember Aaron about Zelophehad's daughters and how this came up in connection with that, that, that each one is to keep his tribal inheritance. So much so that, it, it, for example, if a man had only daughters, yes, they would receive an inheritance, but they could not marry someone out of another tribe. They must marry within their own, anyone they wanted to, within their own tribe. Kind of reminds me of Henry Ford, paint any color you want to as long as it's black, and uh, on, the, on his Model T's. But the... Uh, Marry whoever you want to, but it has to be within the tribe because the land is not to change. This is why Naboth would not allow his property to be taken by Ahab. It wasn't just because he was stubborn about it. The Lord would forbid that. And so what we have to recognize as the background about them going somewhere else to get their inheritance is that God had put each tribe where he wanted it. And it was their job to seek his help, that messenger of the Lord, the the, the commander of the Lord of hosts, God has said he would be with them. And any failure was not due to a lack of God's strength, but lack of, a lack of perseverance and work 
and determination and faith on the part of the people. And so when you turn to Judges chapter 18, bear that in mind. God had put each tribe, including Dan, where he wanted them. But instead of that, what are they doing? They're doing what is right in their own eyes. We want to go somewhere else. And so that's what's going to happen. Much, not all the tribe, but much of the tribe is going to migrate way to the north and obtain territory up there. But let's see how that happens. They do some spying to see what might be available in verse 2. And as, as they are, are making their way, now here's the thing. I'm not using a map, but that, I'll tell you, I've been on the road many times that goes from Joppa to Kiryat Urim and then up the hill country straight north and that's the path they're taking. And, and so they, they make their way and as they get to the, the uh, mountains of Ephraim uh, they, they happen to, to see the house of, of Micah. And, and they, some of them recognize this, this young Levite, his voice. And what are you doing here? And he tells them, and they say, well, inquire of God that we may know whether the journey on which we will go will be prosperous. In verse 8, the priest said to them, go in peace. May the presence of the Lord be with you on your way. I must hasten to add, it doesn't say God gave him that answer. He's doing what is right in his own eyes. This is what he said. He doesn't have a word from the Lord. And so these men, five men, they're, they're, they're spies, and they make their way up to the north. And right at the foot of Mount Hermon is this area of Dan, which is here called Laish in verse 7. Not Lachish, but Laish. And so they, they saw this, and it's there, these people that live there are, are separated. They don't have anyone to help them, and, and it would just be an easy target to, to wipe out those people and take possession of their land. And so they came back all the way down in verse 8 to their brethren in that original location of Dan by the coast near Joppa it says Zora, Eshtaal. And so they said yes let's, let's go. Let's not hesitate to go. Let's go possess it. Verse 9, verse 10 everything we need up there. So 600 men take off. Verse 11. And here again that, that route they encamped in Kiryat Yerim in Judah and then they make their way north in verse 13. There they are, the mountains of Ephraim. And now they're back at the house of Micah. And what they do this time is to talk about, you know, in the house of Micah, they've got some gods there. And they've got a Levite there. And, and what should we do about that? And so it's like, well, we need to take that with us. And so, again, the idolatry of one man, the shrine, the images in that shrine of one man, the apostate priest, the, 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 the innovations that led to the appointment of someone that was not uh, qualified to be priest of one man that's going to be the idolatry of a whole tribe. Do you see it goes from bad to worse as people do what is right in their own eyes. And so they just, they just take everything that's in that shrine in verse 5. And uh, at first the priest says, well, what are you doing? And they said, well, listen, you be quiet. You come with us. Wouldn't it be better for you to be the priest to a whole tribe instead of one man? And so the priest's heart was glad. There's no conviction on his part. He's doing what is right in his own eyes. It's like, wow, this would, this would be a promotion. This would be great. And so the priest's heart was glad. Well, this is, this is, uh, this is very fortuitous. Yeah, this is good. And, and so the thing is, he took, that is the priest, he helps him load things up. See that? He took the ephod, that's the priestly garment, the household gods, that's the teraphim, the carved image, and took his place among them. He's helping them load it up. And so as they're leaving, uh, 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 they leave, and uh, Micah finds out after he arrives back home what's happened. He catches up with them, and like, what are you doing? Verse 24, you've taken away my gods which I've made, and priest, and, and you've gone away. What more do I have? I mean, I don't know if this is pathetic, if it's semi-funny. I mean, it's not really funny. But it's like, you're taking the gods that I made. Well, of course, the gods that he made can't defend themselves, apparently. They're not doing him any good. Now, what do I have left if you take away my gods? And they basically say, you better be quiet. 
we have some men among us that will turn on you. And so, of course, he couldn't deal with that, uh, uh, with those odds. And so, verse 26, he goes back home. So, what happens is, they take the things that Micah had made. Over and over, this, it talks about what Micah had made. Man making gods. Idolatry. And so they, they in fact do go to this location of Laish. There's no deliverer. Verse 28. And so they struck the city. They burned the city with fire. And verse 29, they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan their father. However, the name of the city formerly was Laish. Then verse 30 says, the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image. So, <laughs> it's talking about contextually the carved image that they brought that was Micah's. So, they're setting it up in Dan. And now we learn something. It just keeps getting worse. Because now we learn who this priest is. The writer has saved this for last. And that is Jonathan, the son of Gershon, the son of Moses. Now, if, if your translation says Manasseh, that's a variant reading, but you'll have a footnote that says Moses. If you have the ESV or the NIV or the New Revised Standard, they will all say Moses. Moses, Gershom was Moses' son. And then you have Jonathan, grandson. Some suggest that the word could be used in the sense of great-grandson. I wouldn't argue that point, but the point of it is, either way, it's a direct descendant of Moses. Moses, the lawgiver. Moses, the man of God. And here you have just that third generation, or perhaps fourth generation at most, that has so turned away from what he had revealed. Isn't that sad? So, not only that, but regarding Jonathan, it says, And his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, first glance, that might make you think, you know, the Assyrian captivity. But probably this means the Philistine captivity, which is when the Philistines took the tabernacle. Because the next verse makes reference to Shiloh. So, verse 31 they set up for themselves Micah's image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Why does it say that? It says the irony is God had his place of worship. Shiloh, by the way, is just 20 miles north of Jerusalem. And so, of course, where they were in Ephraim was a bit north of Shiloh. And, of course, going to Dan would put it a lot further than the hill country of Ephraim. But the point of it is, this is competing with what God has said. This is juxtaposed with verse 31 that says, all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. So true worship was available. But instead of doing that, they did what was right in their own eyes. And let me tell you something else. You remember later in the days of the divided kingdom, the first thing that Jeroboam did was to set up two shrines with golden calves. And you know where they were. One was at Dan. The other was at Bethel. This paved the way for what Jeroboam done, for what he did, I'm trying to say. Because what he did was to act upon precedent that had been set. He didn't have to build his, his case for that to be a religious spot because this had been going on for years previously. They had, they had a history on that. Sometimes people think, well, it's my life. What I do doesn't affect other people. You don't know how far your influence may go. When, when Micah was making his choices, he was doing it for himself. The Lord's going to prosper me. This is going to be good for me. It's all about me. And little did he know that his idolatry would become the idolatry of a whole tribe. And little did that tribe know it would set the precedent for what the northern kingdom would do that would lead about their captivity by Assyria. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. Their song was, I did it my way. That's not our song. Our song is, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. 
Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Our verse is, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Our example is Jesus, who said in John, 8, John 6, verse 38, I'm come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And our prayer is, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Satan's devices are many and they're deceptive. And one that has worked so well is this matter of getting you to do what is right in your own eyes. I've introduced the concept this morning. We'll want to be dealing with that more this month. But let us determine that we'll hear the Lord and we'll want to do His will and move to the point we can say with Paul, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live in the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This morning, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation in any way, please let us assist you as we stand and sing. Amen.